So hello, good evening. Welcome everyone. My name is Tome Westall Rich. I am the director of the Center for Ignatian Spirituality and the faculty advisor of Alpha Sigma Nu's Boston College chapter. The Honor Society of Jesuit Universities, who is sponsoring the last lecture, along with Intersections, BC Alumni Association, and the Lynch School of Education and Human Development. Today, I have the honor and privilege to introduce Professor Karen Arnold. She has been a member of BC faculty since 1990, having previously been vice president for student service at Reed College. Portland, Oregon. During her 33 years of service, she has taught graduate and undergraduate courses in, in college student devel development theory, gender and higher education, student affairs, doctoral pro seminars, and adult psychology, as well as capstone and cornerstone courses. In her many scholarly articles and books, Professor Arnold has studied the connections between education and adult life by researching how students move into and through higher education. Her research follow basic groups across the transitions from high school to college and from college to career, high school valedictorians, road scholars, and low income and first generation students from innovative and typical high schools. Arnold's 14-year longitudinal study on high school valedictorians has been widely covered in the media. Her pioneering work on transitions of low-income students has introduced the term summer melt into the vernacular and sparked widespread scholar scholarly policy and program responses. I'm sure we will learn more about her her experiences at BC, and her scholarship in her address. Professor Arnold's last lecture will be followed by remarks by former Lynch School Dean and Professor Emerita uh, Diana Paulin, former student Chris Wren, holder of the Mildred B. Erickson Distinguished Chair in Higher Adult and Lifelong Education at Michigan State University, and by her department's chair, Professor Heather Rowan Kenyon. We will end our celebration with a reception in this very same room. Please join me with a round of applause to welcome Professor Karen Arnold, the 2023 Life Lecture Honorary. Okay, wait, I got to put on my student affairs hat and say that there are seats in the front, <laughs> um, probably about six seats, and there's these lovely little side places on the carpet where people who are happy sitting on the floor, which is better than standing up, would be even happier sitting on the floor. Yay. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Tomeo, and also to Bert Howell for the opportunity and the honor of giving this last lecture. And welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I am so glad you're here. Family, friends, colleagues, students, past students. I wish that I could introduce all of you individually to each other, and I'd start out all of your conversations by saying how wonderful you are. Do that yourself at the reception. <laughs> Raise your hand, please, if you've ever been my student. Oh my gosh, that's so great. <laughs> Having you here was my deepest wish for today. And the alumni office liked that wish too. Um, and it's for that reason that they've, they've coordinated and organized this event, which turned out a little bigger than we thought it would. And um, I really need to thank Sean Morrow and the alumni office staff for all the work they put in for this event. Um, and I am deeply grateful to Kelly Armstrong, 
Lynette Robinson and Diana Pullen for dreaming up this retirement celebration and making it happen. Diana. Yay. <laughs> Diana is my former dean and faculty colleague. Lynette and Kelly are my former doctoral students, along with another former doctoral student, Chris Wren, who is here today. These four women have become my teachers and my dear friends, and each of them is a professional superstar. I'm delighted to see so many uh, students here today because um, teaching, has been my deepest vocation and my greatest joy over 33 years at Boston College. Last spring semester, when I taught it for the final time, I counted up the number of times I have taught college student development theory. 52 times. <laughs> Time to retire. <laughs> I went through all my rosters for today's invitation list, and it was for all my classes, and it was such a joy to recall all the students who have taken classes with me over the years. How many students are we talking about in all? Well, in all, I infected, I mean influenced, <laughs> um, a little over 1,600 students, and many of you took more than one class with me. So after all those classes, and dissertations, and advising sessions, and research team meetings, what in the world could be left to talk about? I um, told my friend Greg when he asked that a last lecture was about sharing your wisdom after a long career. He said, that'll be short. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Um, my cousin Danny had a different take. He said, great. You should talk about why college access and completion are still so inequitable and what higher education ought to do to solve that. Somebody really ought to give that talk. <laughs> but that's not where I'm going today. Me, I'm going to follow the guidance of the late, great Father Michael Himes and talk about my obsession, that thing that I return to over and over in my professional life and in my personal life. So here it is, my obsession, what it means to be most fully human. We ought to be able to knock that out in half an hour or so. My career has been a decades-long conversation about human flour flourishing in, adult in adulthood. That's what all my research has been about, from high school valedictorians to college access and persistence. That's been what we've been talking about in every single class I've ever taught. It hasn't been the same conversation over time. Students change, scholarship changes, the world around us changes. Over the years, I've watched myself change in relation to what I've studied and taught. Many of the canonical theories of adulthood culminate in some sort of top stage of human development. I always presented this end point as entirely irrelevant to our students. Our goal, I'd say, is to get them and their students past some sort of middle conventional time when people are just swimming along with society's tide, and it's not the greatest tide. Besides, I'd say, empirical research clearly says, says that hardly anybody ever gets there, and if so, never before midlife. So I'd say to the class, I'm the only person in this classroom who's remotely old enough to even concern myself with, the, with this mythical final achievement of the lifespan. Class, you can skim that part of the reading. It will not be on the exam. So this is my chance, my last lecture. This is my, the talk, the lecture I never got to give, the talk on what my main man, psychologist Robert Keegan, calls the further reaches of development. I've professed for decades that full adulthood is all about constructing your own identity, knowing and owning who you are. Today, I'm going to talk about letting go of that identity. First, figure out who you are. Eventually, very, very eventually, give up that identity you've so carefully constructed. 
I invite you all to take a moment and bring to mind someone you suspect just might be operating at that supposed pinnacle of adult development. Could be somebody you know. Retired BC theology professor John McDarr is someone I'd name. I'd add one of my spiritual teachers, Rabbi Sheila Peltz Weinberg. Could be somebody you don't know. Here, I'd call out the Dalai Lama. John McDarr, Sheila Weinberg, the Dalai Lama. All of them are easily moved and readily show it. They radiate kindness, caring, calm, joy, connection, presence. Who would you name? So to get where we're going, we need to back up and talk about the process of building that identity that I'm now trying hard to surrender. I'll never forget what my child's friend said was the secret to succeeding in middle school. Quote, just do what everybody else does. <laughs> she was not joking. Most of us live by this advice, at least up to the beginning of college and beyond. Here's how a senior in my capstone course described her uh, formula for life. This is an exact quotation. Step one, figure out what everyone else is doing, how the majority of people like to portray their own identity and how everyone else talks, dresses, behaves, etc. Step two, do exactly that, even if you don't necessarily agree with it. And third and finally, step three, do all these things so often you actually start to believe that that is how you should feel and how you should think and you think you should behave. My student followed this advice, this formula, all the way up through her sophomore year at Boston College, at which point it failed her spectacularly. I would like to say I was way more mature than that as a teenager, <laughs> but incriminating evidence and cringeworthy memories would say otherwise. I remember going to school in a skirt so short that I had to curtsy to drink from the water fountain. <laughs> and white Yardley brand lipstick, oh. Um, here's another example, uh, uh, embarrassing one. Decades after high school, I was at a friend's house and I came across what I had written in her high school yearbook. Mary will be friends forever because we're exactly the same. <laughs> I will not go on. <laughs> like past me, my undergraduates and many of the master students are following formulas, scripts, that we don't even realize are out there. My capstone course seniors can recite the script. Do well in high school, get into a good college like BC, make friends, work hard, get a respectable, well-paying job. Find a partner by your mid-20s, get married at 26 or 27, 28 is probably OK, and begin uh, have the first of 2.1 children a few years after that, and then something. Notice that this script means taking others into account. We care about the people in our lives. We put ourselves out for them. We try not to disappoint them. We want to belong. We genuinely sign on to rules and norms and ethical standards. We want to be a good person. So we try hard to follow what our parents and teachers and coaches and clergy and influencers tell us to do. We do our best to think that others think well of us. Robert Keegan calls this the socialized mind. And a hefty body of research has found that it describes between half and two thirds of all adults across various cultures. But Keegan goes on to say, quote, bringing inside the other's point of view is the triumph and the limit of the socialized mind. One problem is that it matters a lot what crowd you're going along with. Why was I wearing white lipstick? Somebody can be fully socialized as a good gang member or a committed shopper, a loyal white supremacist. There are no end of gurus out there. Another problem is that even wholesome social scripts can and do go off the rails. A teacher gives you a C on your first college paper. Don't they realize you're an A student? 
Your parents don't approve of your boyfriend. Your friends aren't there that time you really needed them. You're taking it on faith that your college major will lead to success in a well-paid, meaningful job in which you can pursue your passion. And what is your passion anyway? Oh, and how's all that supposed to work with having children someday? You're doing what you're supposed to. You're looking like you're supposed to. You're buying what you're supposed to. But you don't like it, or you're not great at it. It's not making you happy. I definitely experienced these kinds of dilemmas, particularly the parents not approving of the boyfriend and the academic track not making you happy. I married that boyfriend. <laughs> 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 and I left music, yeah, there he is. <laughs> um, and I left music after a conservatory degree. And both of those moves turned out very well. But I know how it feels to be caught with conflicting scripts when you're a 20 something good girl, a high achiever, a people pleaser, a script follower. It feels like you're failing. You can't please everyone, and you have no guarantee that everything, anything, will work out. Is it any wonder we have such an epidemic of anxiety and depression among today's college students? As my child once said, it's hard to think about something when you're in it. It's hard to think about something when you're in it. From the perspective of my thoroughly socialized mind, I couldn't see that I was following scripts. I couldn't see that there were scripts. I trotted off to Oberlin to learn how to play the piano. Attached to that prestigious music conservatory I discovered was an intellectually intense, very left-leaning college. This was news to me, and it was very much news to my parents. <laughs> It was at Oberlin that I encountered people and ideas that upended my assumptions about what I thought was simply true and natural everywhere and always, amen. Hey Mary, we can be close and different. My thought not everybody was like me and my family wasn't quite what I thought it was either. My family, my father was always the funny one. I was the designated straight man, really? Maybe dad wasn't always right. In college, I spent time sorting through my childhood labels and figuring out what I believed. I scanned the environment like crazy for clues about what I was good at and what I liked to do. This journey intensified in grad school when I met up with research and theory about social institutions, human development, feminism, Hey, conventional standards for being a good leader conflict with conventional standards for being a good woman. And wait, wait a minute, we humans have established a system where high prestige careers, well-paying careers, conflict with child rearing. I guess I'm not entirely a free agent in charge of my own destiny. Everything, the way things work isn't predestined, natural, and fair. For three decades, I've taught that adulthood requires examining and moving away from the unexamined shoulds that adolescents breathe in with, um, with the air. As the poet Roger Kamenetz writes, never point a loaded should at anyone. Someone could get hurt. <laughs> Instead, I want my students to be consciously aware of their relative privilege in the world, their position in the world. I want them to determine their own values, identities, and relationships. It's from that base that they can prize the full humanity of other people. It's from there that they can see and push back against systems and structures that are limiting and harming their fellow beings. I research the conditions for increasing equity in higher education because a high quality college experience moves students in precisely those directions. And I want everybody to have that opportunity for their sake and for all of our sake. And this isn't just what I want for students. For me, self-authorship, as it's called, is both the goal of higher education and the way forward for our individual and collective well-being. 
So we're done, right? I really do think I'm here. I can see where the shoulds come from and how they weigh me down. I see that the media and my parents and my professional guild and my religion all have takes on who I should be and what I should do. I've chosen to take some of these messages to heart and reject others. Most of the time, I, I know who I am. I don't care that much what other people think about me, not my business. I care very little about how important I am. I understand that other people are not me. I see the presence of culturally and historically conditioned systems and structures. I'm comfortable with ambiguity and complexity. In fact, I'm quite suspicious of simple answers. All of this sounds good, right? Pretty dang mature. <laughs> I can live here in self-authorship. Let's get everyone here. What could possibly follow the accomplishment of having a conscious self-chosen core of what one believes and feels is important? What could possibly be more evolved than realizing that a lot of the ways one lives are based on human-made stories that you don't necessarily have to sign on to? What could be better than crafting my own life story? Well, I am not done. There is something more. To quote Oliver Wendell Holmes, I would not give a fig for the simplicity on this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. The simplicity on the other side of complexity. I long for that. I study and backpack and go to synagogue and meditate to attain it. I catch glimpses of it. I share that Holmes quote with my students every year, and they have no idea what it means. <laughs> I'm not really sure I do either. The territory beyond self-authorship is tricky because so few people ever get there, and probably because it's more of a felt sense that's not so easy to put into words. I don't really understand it. I'm certainly not there myself. My man Keegan calls it self-transforming mind. Maslow called it self-transcendence, saying that it's a step beyond self-actualization. Folks from Western and Eastern traditions call it various other things. Ego-transcendent, unitive, inter-individual, non-dual awareness, inter-being, enlightenment. <laughs> So let me take a crack at it. For me, this way of being means letting go of that defined self and that story of my life that I worked so hard to construct, or at least softening them. I remember interviewing a high school, a former high school valedictorian when he was in his mid-20s and I was just a few years older. At that time, he was an Ivy League graduate in philosophy and a wildly successful off-the-floor commodities trader. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now, I asked him. I can't answer that question, he answered. Of course you can't be sure, I said, but where do you think you'll be? He doubled down. He said, I refuse to answer that question. I would never categorize and label myself. I wouldn't limit myself like that. I remember thinking clearly, oh, give me a break. <laughs> this is a standard interview question, and every other valedictorian answered it just fine. <laughs> Decades later, I think I finally caught up with that valedictorian's answer. Am I a scholar, a teacher, a musician, a Jew, a hiker, meditator, wife, mother, friend, daughter, sister? Am I my beliefs? Am I the story of my life? Is there a story of my life? As Walt Whitman says, I contain multitudes, but I am not equivalent to my roles or my activities or my values or my beliefs. I am not the narratives that I tell to package myself coherently. Instead, I'm more and more aware that all of these really are just fictions that limit and cause trouble. Um, as the Sufi mystic Rumi wrote, why suffer at the hands of things that don't exist? 
And I agree with the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Adichie about the dangers of any single story. Apparent opposites, contending factions, categories of people and things, all of these can only exist together because of each other in relationship. The late Ursula Le Guin, the novelist, wrote, only in dark, the light, only in dying, life. I am made up with and of others. This truth operates on the scale of personal relationships. Over 44 years of marriage, I am coming to understand that what's true or what's called for lies between Jeff and me, not somehow within one of us. We don't see each other as the handy one or the responsible one or the funny one. Jeff and I are both funny because we um, let each other be funny and we laugh when we try. This reminds me of the first year student I had some years ago who was struggling mightily with the um, transition into BC. Why? Nobody here knows I'm cool. <laughs> so is he cool? <laughs> the truth of interconnection operates in nature. Here's John Muir. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. As we sit here, our very atoms are, are being exchanged with each other and everything else around us. At the very largest scale, I recently read an article saying that um, physicists, um, more and more physicists are coming to the conclusion that space and time itself is an illusion. Instead, in a quantum universe, there are no individual objects. Everything's inseparable. At the level of society, Martin Luther King Jr., quote, in a real sense, all life is interrelated. The agony of the poor impoverishes the rich. The betterment of the poor enriches the rich. We are inevitably our brother's keeper because we are our brother's brother. And of course, religion's all over this. Religious traditions across time, across traditions, um, consistently describe some sort of experience of the direct experience of the oneness of everything. I'm not actually seeking what I guess must be this very highest level of development, some persistent state of self-transcendence. Nah, I'm just trying to remember that I am not my merit badges or my labels or titles or roles. Somehow I'm aiming to loosen that sense of Karen as being inside of me, separate and distinct. Not only to blur my boundaries, but to recognize that those boundaries are made up. Why should we even try to transcend an individual sense of self? Let me stop and say here clearly, this, does not, this is not necessary to make you a good person or even a happy person. You are already and intrinsically worthy. You are worthy. <laughs> it makes sense, though, that seeing myself and others as fundamentally co-creating and mutually transforming means that the growth and well-being of other people is crucial to me. It also means the ability to hold contradictions simultaneously. Developmentalism, yep. Critical theory, yep. Difference and unity, yep and yep. And here's the last one for the uh, developmentalists in the, in the um, congregation. Um, constructivist developmental stage theories, flawed and problematic powerful and worthwhile, uh-huh. Freeing myself from being identified with my own assumptions and positions seems like it would bring a measure of personal peace. More important than that, it seems to me that loosening our collective boundaries is the way forward in making progress with our systemic giant complex problems like climate change and racism, income inequality, war. Not everybody needs to give up the self. And I'm not saying I will or even that I can, but it would be really good to have some self-transforming leaders or skilled interbeings sprinkled here and there. Really good. The late Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh 
wrote that he saw a pattern in the fates of his countrymen who were escaping the war in Vietnam by boat. When the crowded refugee boats met with storms or pirates, if everyone panicked, all would be lost, he said. But if even one person remained calm and centered, every, that showed the way for everyone to survive. It was enough. I'm thinking that that calm person on the boat touched into the simplicity on the other side of complexity. At this point, maybe you've, you're convinced that it's a good thing to try for, but how in the world would anyone ever release the self? Well, I wonder that too. <laughs> and sadly, I'm quite sure that I can't do it just by trying really hard. But let me share some glimpses of what I'm coming to think might help. Students, remember how in many of my classes, I've asked you to share the experience that you had as an undergraduate that most shaped you as a person? Nearly all of your stories occurred outside of the classroom. Mine too, although that's all kinds of disturbing as a classroom instructor. So in my 20s, I soaked up wisdom about what it meant to be an adult by hanging out outside of the classroom extensively in research and social circles with graduate school mentors. Uh, my circle of teachers stretches beyond elders to include students, friends, and colleagues, my husband, my child, people I know, uh, historical figures, or people I don't know that I've encountered through books or online talks. From age 30 or so, I've been learning deep life lessons at my Jewish congregation and on the Appalachian Trail. For the last 15 years or so, I've been learning in meditation circles, and at BC, I've hung out in student formation circles. And of course, I've spent over three decades studying and teaching what it means to be human, most recently in my beloved uh, capstone course on adulting. Those are the places there, that I've found many ideas and sources and conversation partners and a few, a very few, precious self-transforming models. These are the places where I've encountered nature and poetry and music and spiritual practices that focus on the body and the heart, not just and not primarily on my overdeveloped mind. In particular, meditation teachers have taught me Buddhist concepts of the non-self. I've learned practices for observing my small Karen self that help move her off center stage. On the Appalachian Trail, I've given up core aspects of my identity, including my name. Out there, I'm called walkabout, and nobody knows, much less cares, what degrees and titles I have. And social conventions like showering are pretty much out the window, too. <laughs> Meditation and backpacking have some things in common, like being unplugged and quiet, accepting constantly changing conditions, and living in your body instead of your head. Unitasking, direct experience, and relinquishing the illusion of control. So I've talked about what has helped me to continue growing as an adult. The moral of the story, put up your antenna and pay attention when they swivel in the direction of wisdom or even when they twitch. Go in that direction. Here's a version of this advice from the Buddha 2,600 years ago. Associate with mindful people, the Buddha said. Avoid mean and angry and insensitive ones. <laughs> Pretty timeless advice. I'd add that it's also best to avoid people in situations that peddle hysteria and those that guarantee certainty or capital T, truth. Also good advice is the formula I learned, uh, the Ignatian formula I learned at halftime retreats. Be attentive, be reflective, be loving. I see some clues in all of this for higher education. We have some good models at Boston College, like student retreats, service offerings, immersion programs. Signature BC uh, curricula like Pulse and Perspectives are all about connecting the classroom to students' own lives. So are explicitly formational cornerstone and capstone courses 
we now have a brand new department of formative education in the Lynch School. And of course, there are wonderful faculty offerings like intersections. Let's get real though. If we are genuinely dedicated to the development, the human development of the adults on our campuses, and if we really want the self-transforming few among us to hang out with us less wise ones, we are going to have to redefine and, and reward in a different way what we call faculty productivity. We'll need to move relational and experiential education from these wonderful fringe programs to the center of what we do. Contemplative practices of quieting, observing, reflecting, and slowing down also fit this way of looking at the world. We stink at that. For an institution devoted to the life of the mind, we universities have set things up so people don't have any time to think and reflect, much less to experience and feel. So what might all this mean for my life and for yours? We're heading into the home stretch here. My students love the text from Rilke, from his letters to a young poet. Live the questions now, he famously wrote. Perhaps then, someday far in the future, you will gradually, without ever noticing it, live your way into an answer. There's a reason that you young adults resonate with the idea of living in the questions. You're working to sift through your trunks full of hand-me-down answers and ready-made solutions. You're struggling to stay open to possibilities and to construct your own story. That's exactly how to live the questions and exactly what you should be doing. Keep doing that. Help others to do that too. For me though, someday far in the future is here. I have been living my way into some sort of answer. Don't know what that answer is exactly, but I get glimpses out of the corner of, of my eye and in flashes of clarity. And at this point, what I'm glimpsing is that all beings are interactive process, movement, and change. We are all interactive process, movement, and change. I'm glimpsing that peace and joy and freedom and justice come from giving up the fiction of the individual bounded self. I plan to continue putting myself where I can practice that thing that Thich Nhat Hanh calls interbeing. I have a visual image for interbeing. It's a kaleidoscope in which we all come together in constantly shifting patterns. We are not distinct colors blended and fused into a single color. We are not pillars, separate pillars, even strong, solid pillars standing side by side with a connecting archway. Not a fusion, not a pillar. I see us as an indivisible, ever-shifting kaleidoscope of distinctness within union. My goal isn't actually to set aside the ego and all specific attachments. That's really hard, and I am quite fond of clinging to certain of my attachments. And my goal is not to bliss out and ignore suffering. Quite the contrary. I want to hear the cries of the world without fleeing or getting swept up in them so that I can respond skillfully and compassionately. I want to see more clearly with less distortion and greater perspective. I'm with the Dalai Lama who says that altruism is wise selfishness in which taking care of others is actually the best way to fulfill your own interests. Inner peace and wise action naturally arise when you feel that everyone you meet is part of you. We inter-are. Living in and from that truth is my best answer about what it means to be most fully human. Gradually living into that answer is my goal. And this might not be the answer, but somehow we do have to figure out how to come together without obliterating our differences. We have to do that. As my teacher Sylvia Borstein says, it's not easy being a person. 
And she goes on to say, life is like batting practice. The machine keeps sending you balls. That damn machine sent us COVID. It sends uncertainty and change and aging and dying. And we're all in this together, depending on each other for our well being and actually for our planet's survival. So, yes, let us all work towards self authored identities. That's the worthy goal for most of us and for higher education. That's not only plenty, it's actually ambitious. But let's hold those identities lightly. Let's compose our own stories, but let's keep them provisional. First, figure out who you are. And when you get to midlife and beyond, consider giving up that self you've so carefully put together. At least that's my retirement plan. Thank you. Thank you.